Hello everybody. In today's video, we're going to discuss AP Biology Topic 6.5 on the regulation of gene expression. In this video, we're going to look at the variety of mechanisms that cells use to regulate the expression of genes contained within their genome and the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So let's get into it. Just as genes are important for encoding the specific characters and traits of organisms, the regulation of this gene expression is equally important. Now, there are a variety of reasons as to why cells want to regulate how they express certain genes and when they express those genes. And when comparing prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, we can see that these relate directly to their function and their survival within their organisms, within their environment. Um, prokaryotic cells, single-celled organisms, often live in environments where they have to depend on the resources that they are able to obtain. So if they don't need a specific protein, it would be wasteful for them to produce that protein. So in order to save on energy and resources, prokaryotic cells are only going to express certain genes, certain proteins, um, when they absolutely need them. And when we can compare that reason to eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells often exist as part of tissue systems working together in a coordinated fashion. And eukaryotic organisms contain many different types of cells which have specific functions. These specific functions are facilitated through the turning on and off of specific gene clusters in order for that cell to perform its duty within the organism. So we're going to look at some of these mechanisms, but first let's start by looking at the structure of the gene sequence and the regions that are important for regulating that expression. So in addition to the coding regions within a gene, there are some non-coding sequences that we refer to as regulatory sequences. These are sequences of nucleotides to which regulatory proteins can bind, and these can turn on or off or essentially stimulate or repress the expression of particular gene segments. Now, the expression of certain genes can be regulated at a variety of different levels, including pre- and post-transcription and pre- and post-translation. We're going to focus here on a little bit of pre-transcription type of regulation, which involves those regulatory sequences which are located at or near our promoter region on the gene sequence. Um, to these regulatory sequences, the regulatory proteins may bind. We refer to these as transcription factors, and they're able to control whether a gene is active or expressed or inactive and not expressed. And we have a couple of different regulatory mechanisms. One of these is a negative regulation where we have a protein called a repressor which binds to the regulatory sequence and prevents the binding of RNA polymerase so no transcription can occur. Now comparing that negative regulation, we also have positive regulation. Positive regulation involves the binding of a promoter to that regulatory sequence which gives RNA polymerase somewhere to bind and stimulates transcription. Now for our intents and purposes, we are going to focus on some of those negative regulation mechanisms within prokaryotic cells. Remember that regulation of gene expression in prokaryotic cells allows them to conserve energy and resources by making proteins only when they are absolutely needed by the cell. So let's take a closer look at gene sequences along the prokaryotic genome. 
Now, prokaryotic genes are typically controlled by a single promoter, which we call an operon. Now, operons contain an operator sequence upstream of our promoter to which repressors may bind. Because we're dealing with repressors, we identify this as a negative regulatory mechanism. We have a few different types of operons uh, depending on whether the repressor is bound or unbound in order to turn off that gene. Um, so we'll start with an inducible operon, that is an operon that can be activated. So an inducible operon is turned off unless it is needed. And compare that to a repressible operon and so an operon that is able to be turned off, a repressible operon is turned on unless it is not needed. And we're going to take a look at a couple of the two main types of operons, each an example of these inducible and repressible systems. We'll be starting with our inducible operon, which is typically um, the example used is our LAC operon. LAC operons are used to create proteins necessary for breaking down lactose. So when lactose is absent, a repressor is bound to our operator region, and this prevents the binding of our RNA polymerase. So transcription is blocked, and we do not produce any proteins. Now, that is when lactose is absent from the system. So when no lactose is present, we do not produce any proteins necessary for breaking down the lactose. However, when lactose is present, allolactose acts as an inducer. So it binds to the repressor, activates it, which essentially means it is removed from the operator sequence and undergoes some sort of conformational or shape change that allows it to no longer bind to the operator sequence. And this allows RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter and thus transcription can occur. When the repressor is removed, RNA polymerase is able to bind and then transcribe the genes within the operon itself, so we're able to produce those proteins that were once repressed as long as the repressor is no longer bound to the operator sequence. Compare that inducible operon to our repressible operon. Here we use the example of the trip operon, and this is involving the production of tryptophan. So when tryptophan is absent from the system, we have an inactive repressor, which is not able to bind to our operator sequence. So when our repressor is not bound to the operator, RNA polymerase is able to bind and we're able to produce the proteins that are encoded within that gene region. Now, when tryptophan is present, it binds just like allolactose, but this time it binds as a co-repressor to the repressor protein. Once it binds, it also causes a conformational or shape change within the repressor, allowing it to bind to the operator and prevent transcription. So once our repressor is activated, it is able to bind to the operator sequence, which causes RNA polymerase to no longer be able to bind and thus prevents the transcription of the genes within that gene sequence. So before we start looking at some eukaryotic mechanisms, let's summarize those negative regulatory mechanisms within the prokaryotic genome, uh, these being the inducible systems where we have an inducer operating with our transcription factor, also known as a repressor in this system, causing the repressor to no longer be able to bind to the operator and allow RNA polymerase to transcribe the genes. Comparing that to our repressible system, 
where the product of our metabolic pathway acting as a co-repressor binds to the transcription factor, also known as a repressor protein, which is then unable to bind to the operator, allowing RNA, which is then able to bind to the operator, allowing RNA polymerase to no longer be able to bind and thus block transcription. Now, eukaryotic gene regulation operates in a generally similar way to that of prokaryotes, with the difference here being that we do not have the operator sequence and that the promoter region includes just a few regulatory sequences, including things like enhancers and silencers, which we're going to talk about. Now, the key to regulating gene expression in eukaryotic cells is order, in order to differentiate the functions of different types of cells. Now, in eukaryotic systems, RNA polymerase cannot directly bind to the promoter region and instead requires some general transcription factors to facilitate its binding to the gene sequence. So we can control the levels of transcription factors present within the cell in order to regulate the activity of our RNA polymerase. If we do not have those general transcription factors, RNA polymerase is not going to be able to bind and thus transcription is not going to be able to occur. But when we have high levels of transcription factors present within the cell, RNA polymerase is going to be able to readily bind to the DNA sequence and thus transcribe the genes necessary to produce particular proteins. Now, the regulatory sequences of a eukaryotic gene are typically upstream of the promoter, and these contain a variety of, regula of locations where our regulatory proteins may bind. Now, those general transcription factors um, may be tissue-specific to regulate cell differentiation, so we're able to turn on and off particular genes depending on which type of cell we are located in. And we can also include things that increase the level of gene transcription. These are known as activator proteins. Activator proteins bind to what we call enhancer sites and increase the rate of transcription by mediating the transcription factor complex formation. So they're able to pull more transcription factors in order to produce a greater level of transcription within the cell. And in a minute, in addition to these activator proteins, we also have silencer um, sites, which can bind repressor proteins, and these decrease the rate of transcription by preventing the formation of transcription factor complexes and thus decreasing the amount of transcription that RNA polymerase is able to undergo. Now, these are all important in determining which genes are turned on and off in specific regions of a body. And one of the important types of gene families that we look at in this case are Hox genes. Uh, Hox genes encode for a family of transcription factors that are expressed in different combinations depending on the type of cell or the part of the body that that cell is growing in. And we have previously talked about Hox genes when discussing cell communication. Essentially, we are able to transcribe certain genes in certain areas of the body in certain segments in order to differentiate that segment from other parts of the body. So the DNA sequences that regulatory proteins bind to are known as control elements, these being our enhancer and silencer sites. And these can be located close to the promoter, which we call proximal elements, while others can be farther away from the promoter, and these can be referred to as distal elements. Regulatory proteins will typically bind to the distal, farther away, control elements, whereas transcription factors usually bind to the closer to the promoter, proximal elements. So we can see here how DNA loops 
in order for some regulatory proteins like enhancers and silencers to bind to those more distal elements of our regulatory sequences, these including enhancers and silencers. Now, the mechanism of this mechanism of this regulatory mechanism for gene expression is able to control many different types of proteins and production of characters within an organism. And one of the ones that we like to emphasize in AP biology is that of the stickleback fish. Stickleback fish um, actually will either express or not express a particular gene for a pelvic spine. So when we have the transcription turned on for a particular trait, we can see that we have the development of the bony plates and spines along the pelvis. And when that transcription is turned off, we do not have any of the expression of that armor or spine within the pelvis. So depending on whether a gene is turned on or turned off, we're able to see that expressed within the organism. Now a key thing to remember here is that even if a gene is not expressed, it is still present within the genome. And that's one of the things the stickleback is important to show because you are able to have an organism which does not produce a pelvic spine but still carries the genes for that pelvic spine. So if we were to turn that gene back on, it would still be able to produce that pelvic spine and thus increase the chances that it could survive in a different or changing environment. Now the final regulatory mechanism that we're going to discuss are some epigenetic changes. Now these types of modifications are just in eukaryotic cells where we have the chromatin uh, present <clears throat> as a DNA histone complex. And one of the epigenetic changes that can play a role in gene expression is that of chromatin modeling. This is a type of regulation that occurs through alterations in the chromatin structure. And we're going to focus here on some acetyltransferase activity <clears throat> on the tightness of the DNA being wound along our histones. So if you think back to our unit on the structure of chromosomes and how we go from a DNA sequence to chromatin to chromosomes, you should remember that histones are a type of protein around which DNA is wound and together the histone DNA complex makes up our chromatin, which can be further condensed into our chromosomes. So in this chromatin complex, we have some transcription factors and RNA polymerases which can bind things called histone acetyltransferases. These are enzymes which have the ability to add acetyl groups to positively charged amino acids and neutralize their charge. So as we can see down here, we have lysine, one of our positively charged amino acids, to which acetyltransferase will add an acetyl group and produce an acetyl lysine. So we're neutralizing that charge. Acetyl lysine has a zero overall charge. And this is going to play a role in how tightly the DNA is wound on that histone complex. So by reducing or neutralizing the positive charge on our histone tails, um, this reduces the affinity of our histones for the DNA and thus loosens the strand along those histones. So when DNA is tightly wound around the histones, we don't have much interaction with transcription factors. And we can compare that to the loosening of the DNA um, following histone acetyltransferase activity which once the DNA is loosened around that histone, transcription factors are able to more easily access the DNA and thus transcribe particular genes. So, 
I know that regulatory mechanisms are a lot of information. We've covered quite a bit in here today, uh, discussing the differences in regulatory mechanisms of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. But at the end of the day, we are using regulatory sequences to determine whether genes are turned on or turned off in order to meet the needs of our cell. So, in the next video, we're going to look at some more specific examples of how gene expression can lead to the differentiation of particular cells. So, I will see you guys in the next video.